So how do I know I'm growing up as a follower of Jesus? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, how do you know you're taking steps forward in that journey of spiritual growth? Uh, we know at Shoreline there's always people that are here that are followers of Jesus. There's also people who are kind of trying to figure out the whole God and Jesus thing, and you're exploring the Christian faith. So if you're a Christian, these seven things you see up on the screen here, these seven markers of spiritual growth, are a part of your life. They're, they're something you're striving towards. If you're not yet a Christian, these are things that will become part of your life if you choose to follow Jesus. So you see, you see uh, th this idea of Bible engagement. If I'm growing as a Christian, I'm growing to know and love and follow the Bible. That, that's just, that's part of, I'm growing up in my faith, but I'm growing to love this book and follow it. Passionate prayer. I know I'm growing as a Christian if I'm, if I'm talking with God more, if I'm listening for God's voice more, if I'm praying to them alone or with groups of people, I'm growing up in my faith. Wholehearted worship. I have a growing passion to worship God, not just gathered for an hour a week, but kind of throughout my week, that, that my whole life becomes an act of worship to God. Humble service. Jesus served people humbly. If I follow him, I'm learning to serve. So I'm reaching out and helping people grow in, in different ways. I'm, I'm serving them as I go along. And then consistent community. You know, I'm having connection with people and I'm having great community and organic outreach. I'm naturally sharing my faith. That's it. That's all seven of them. Oh, I skipped one, right? What did I skip? Joyful generosity. A lot of people skip that. Uh, that's, that, that, that's one that I've discovered over my years of being a pastor that there's two of those seven markers of growth, those natural things that Jesus modeled for us that Christians tend to skip. It's the one called joyful generosity and the one called organic outreach. We haven't saved those for the last three weeks because they're less important. That's just kind of how they flowed out as we prepared this. But joyful generosity, some people kind of freak out when it comes to this one. I remember as a, as a young Christian, I said to God, God, you can have all of me. We just sung the song, you can have it all, Lord. I would have stood up and sung that song with all my heart as a young Christian. But if somebody says, would you give $10 to the work of Jesus? I would have said no. But Lord, you can have it all, Lord. Just not my $10. No, but it's, it's like, it was like, I would say, God, you have all of me, but I didn't take what he gave me, material goods, and actually make them available. That's where I was at. That was part of my journey. And I praise God I praise God that there's people all around the world that love Jesus, that have met him, that have come to the cross, and they have become joyfully generous. Because I believe that joyful generosity can change the world. It really can. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because in 1979, in 1979, there was a church down in Garden Grove, down in Southern California. Garden Grove Community Church. And it was filled with people who were joyfully generous. They were so generous that they underwrote the youth ministry of the church. And their youth group had about a thousand students coming to it. A thousand students. You couldn't fit all those kids in this room here. And somebody invited me to come to the youth group at Garden Grove Community Church. And I showed up. And they put on this amazing program. And it was in that place that I met Jesus. When I showed up, this is what I looked like. I haven't changed much. <laughs> it was surfing and it was disco, baby. And you can see it. Uh, but... At that season of my life, I, I showed up in this big auditorium at this church, Garden Grove Community Church, and I started learning about Jesus. And you know how much money the young people were giving to that church at that time? Probably as much as high school kids give to churches today. Not a whole lot. Maybe a little bit, but not enough to run the whole program they were running, not enough to pay for their staff. But I praise God for those people at Garden Grove Community Church. Most of them I've never met, but I will meet them one day in glory. And I would love to go to each, up to each one of them and say thank you for your faithful, joyful generosity because you created a place where I could learn about Jesus. In, in 1966, in West Michigan, there was a church called Fourth Reformed Church. And there was a family that took their family there and this was their little girl. Their little girl at five years old. Beautiful, hasn't changed a bit. And so Sherry Lynn Vleem went to church Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and Wednesday nights and learned about Jesus and fell in love with Jesus. At five years old, that little girl prayed to receive Jesus in a small local church filled with people who were joyfully generous enough to pay for things so that kids could learn about Jesus. She's now Sherry Lynn Harney. And like I said, she doesn't look a bit different. You can look at her, strong cheekbones, beautiful smile, bright eyes. That's my wife. But there were people in a church who gave faithfully and joyfully to make a place for her to learn about Jesus. In 1990, in 1990, a couple showed up 
I, I'm sorry, 1998, uh, 1998, 1998, a young couple showed up at Shoreline Church. Here's that couple. See the, see the glaring, glowing red dot in that guy's eyes? He was not a healthy guy at the time. So this, this, guy, this guy was an addict at the time. He'd overcome some addictions. He still had other addictions. Didn't know Jesus. And Keith Kruger, who's now one of your pastors, showed up at Shoreline Church in Monterey, California. And some of you were here at that time. Some of you were members of this church. And your prayers and your love and your service and your giving created a place where Keith could learn about Jesus. And were you married at that time? No. They're standing right here, right? Oh, they're sitting right here. Okay. So Keith and Shannon were not married at that time. Shannon, were you a Christian when you came here? No. So two non-believers. So the same guy stood up in front of you about 10 minutes ago and talked to you about being joyful and giving. He says he actually handles the church's money. That guy up there uh, is now a pastor. He, he began volunteering at Shoreline, became a Christian at Shoreline, began to walk with Jesus at Shoreline, felt a call to be a pastor at Shoreline, went and got a degree in theology as he was part of Shoreline, and is now one of your pastors. That's what joyful... Yeah, somebody say amen to that. Yeah, right? Um, Joyful generosity from Christian people can change lives and change homes and change futures and change the world. One more picture for you. In 1990, this young soldier became a follower of Jesus. And his family cycled through Monterey a number of times as he came as a soldier, then he came as a, as a, as a, a teacher, then he became as a teaching fellow at the Naval Postgraduate School. And Sean Stroud uh, in, in, and I wrote it down here, in, in 2012, as he was here as, as a colonel in the military and as a teaching fellow at Naval Postgraduate School, he felt a call to ministry right here in this worship center at a night of worship. And, became, and, and then felt a call to retire from the military and eventually become a pastor here at Shoreline Church. Many of you were here at that time and your faithful giving created a place for the Spirit of God to call this person during a worship service to have a whole change in their lives. And so, God, this is our prayer today. In some sense, I could just end, end the sermon right now with an amen because, Lord, we, we can see the reality that when your people give joyfully and generously and when your church is strong and healthy, whether it's Fourth Reformed Church in Holland, Michigan, or whether it's Shoreline Church in Monterey, California, God, you create an environment for lives to be transformed. So we pray that today we would drop our resistances, we would open our hearts and our minds, we would look at our Savior, Jesus, and learn more about joyful generosity. We pray this in his beautiful name. Amen. Well, in this series, what we're doing as we talk about becoming an organic disciple is we're talking about kind of three movements. Number one, we look at Jesus. We open up, the, we open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, and we look at the life of Jesus, and we say, what did he do? How did he live? Who was this Jesus? And I will tell you right now, Jesus was joyfully generous. And then we say, okay, so what do we learn from Jesus? Then we say, okay, if we're Christians, if we're his followers, we become like Jesus. So today we ask us, well, how do I become joyfully generous? And then could it be that when I become more like Jesus and live like him in the world, God could use you and me to shine his light into the world through lives that look like Jesus? So let's start with looking at Jesus today. Jesus was the most joyfully generous being in the universe. In all the universe, in all space and time, there is no being who's ever been more joyfully generous than Jesus. It was Jesus who left the glory of heaven, the beauty of heaven, the songs of heaven, to come as one of us. He gave up everything to come to you and shine his light so you could know him and love him and follow after him. And there's, there's what I call a mystery we will never solve in the reality of the incarnation, the coming of Jesus. But if you have your Bibles, you can go to Philippians chapter two. And in Philippians chapter two, we have this picture of Jesus choosing to leave the glory of heaven, choosing to come among us, choosing to be jo with joy. The Bible says, even says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. When Jesus even looked at the cross, giving his life for you, he still had joy in what he could do for you and do for me. But in Philippians chapter two, beginning in verse six, we read these words about Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He took on flesh. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. When we look at Jesus, we see the most generous being in all the universe. Jesus said, I will leave the glory of heaven. I will come to this world and take on human flesh. And there, there's something in that incarnation when Jesus came, there's a part of this mystery we can't comprehend because Jesus left the glory of heaven fully God, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the Son of God, left the glory of heaven, and it says he emptied himself. That word emptied, he emptied himself in the English. is just one word in the Greek language, which was what this was written in. And that word is kenosis. And that word kenosis means to pour out, to empty. So here's Jesus, fully God. He emptied something of himself because he could take on a human body. He still, but he was still, all of his character, all of his nature was still divine. So, and that's why I say it's a mystery we can't understand. I can't comprehend how God Almighty comes among us as one of us. But Jesus came as fully God and yet was fully human so that he could die in your place and pay for your sins and take your burdens and your weight of all your sins and wash them away. That's generosity. I could be generous my whole life, as much as I could possibly be generous, and it can't begin to compare to what Jesus Christ has already given to me because he gave his own life. He emptied himself to come as one of us. Jesus gave and gave and gave. It was his nature. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you read the Gospels, and all you look for is how did Jesus give to people? How did Jesus sacrifice, surrender, pour himself out for people? You will see it over and over and over again. To the broken, he gave healing. To the lonely, he gave friendship. To the hungry, he gave food. To the people who were excluded, he gave a family. He gave everything. Sometimes just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just watch the giving nature of Jesus. It, when Jesus saw a need, he longed to meet that need. And that's the invitation to us to become more and more and more like Jesus. He gave and he gave and he gave. Just like his father so loved the world, he gave his only son. And when Jesus gave and gave and gave, he really gave us an example. To be a Christian is to be like Jesus. If Jesus is the most joyfully generous being in the universe and we are his followers, that means, guess what? We get to learn to be generous. It's just part of the deal. And if you're not yet a Christian, and there, again, there's many people who are part of Shoreline. I know there's always non-believers at Shoreline, and this is how I know. Almost every time we invite people who don't know Jesus to accept Jesus, people put faith in Jesus for the first time. God brings people here that don't yet know Jesus. They're examining, they're curious, they're learning. But they say, I'm not a Christian yet, but I want to know more about Jesus. And the people are nice and the donors are wonderful and it's nice to come to Shoreline, so they come. But if you're here and you say, I'm not yet a Christian, I want you to know something, that part of following Jesus is becoming like Jesus and part of being like Jesus is growing in generosity. But it's a glorious adventure. It truly is. And so Jesus was joyfully generous. So then what, what do we do? We're stepping into a joyfully generous life. We're learning as his followers to become joyfully generous. And some of you know my story, that I grew up in an atheistic home, that I grew up and I, I, when I became a Christian, I knew I was going to be a pastor. I still wasn't giving. I still wasn't, I wasn't generous. I wasn't joyful about it I, because I didn't give. I wouldn't share. And I, I, would, I, would, I would tell you, I give my whole life to Jesus, but he can't have my stuff. That's how I live my life. And then God brought Sherry into my life and she grew up learning to be joyfully generous. And her encouragement and her challenge caused me to look at this and grapple with it. But it took me probably close to 10 years to get to the point where I was actually joyful. I started being generous because I realized that's what God's word said, but my heart wasn't it. I mean, I was like, I would do it. But if you say, do you love it? I'd go, no, but I'm being faithful. And it probably took 10 years to get to the point where actually my heart was lined up with my actions. And I will tell you right now, for Sherry and I as a couple, we love to be generous. We look for reasons to be generous. And that's, but that's it's taken time for that to change. And so, so Jesus modeled joyful generosity. But listen to this. God not only models infinite generosity, he calls us to generous lives. You can say, well, God just models it, but that doesn't mean I'm supposed to do it, except that Jesus was clear we are. And all of the Bible is clear that we're called as his people to be generous and joyful as we are. In Matthew chapter 6, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about generosity. And here's what he says in verse 2 of Matthew 6. Jesus says, So when you give to the needy, 
Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Jesus says, and, and when you give to the needy. He doesn't say if you give to the needy. He doesn't say that. He says when you give. Jesus presumes his people are going to be generous. If we follow him, we become generous. But he says, don't do it to be honored by others. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, they've received their full reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your right hand, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What is Jesus talking about? In those days, there were people who were very religious. But when they would pray, they would pray in the street corners. It was basically their prayer was like this. Oh, God. And they're saying, look at me, look at me. Look how religious I am. Look. And, they're, and they're praying not to God, but to impress people. There were people who gave gifts, not really to meet those needs or out of a heart that was changed, but just so other people would see them and be impressed. And Jesus says, that's not what it's about. Your generosity is not putting on a show for other people. It's meeting needs. It's honoring God. It's becoming who God's meant for you to be. And so check your heart as you're giving. But God calls us to generosity. And then God delights in joyful generosity. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 19. Uh, God looks at joyful generosity and celebrates. And when God captures the heart and transforms the life, something begins to happen. And we begin to realize that it's not all about me and mine. It's about God and what honors him. So in Luke chapter 19, Jesus encounters this man who has basically been, become rich on the backs of his own people. He was extorting his own people. He, 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 he was a guy who was all about himself. And this guy wanted to see Jesus. He sees Jesus. Jesus invites him down out of this tree, ends up having a meal with him. And this guy named Zacchaeus has his heart changed. He encounters Jesus. He realizes he's the Messiah, and he gives his heart to Jesus. And here's what happens next. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything... I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus was transformed. He responded much more quickly than I did when I met Jesus. But his heart was transformed. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And then Jesus speaks about himself and he says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Generosity and the gospel and touching lives are connected she said, I came to seek and save the lost. When he reached Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was transformed and all of his life changed, including his resources. And then Jesus also warned us about the dangers of loving stuff. Jesus warned us again and again. And then the Spirit of God, through different people in the New Testament, particularly the Apostle Paul, gives a lot of warnings saying, listen, if the heart of Jesus is joyful generosity, if we're called to be joyfully generous, what gets in the way? What are some of the problems? What should we be careful of? And here's some of the things the Bible talks about. Here's a warning. Beware of hoarding. Beware of hoarding. More, more, me, me, mine, mine. Collect more, collect more. Not, not you, it's for me. Beware of just gathering and gathering and gathering. If you're a note taker, write down Luke chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 12, there's a wonderful story about this person who became wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and they just basically collected, hoarded more, more, me, me. And at the end, this things kind of fall apart for this person. And Jesus says this in verse 21 of Luke 12. This is how it will be to whoever uh, be, be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Jesus gives a warning. If you're all about me, me, storing up for me, me, and not rich towards God, he just says, be careful. And that's, that's a pitfall. That's trouble. Read Luke 12. You'll see it. You'll get the message. Jesus also asked the question, who is your master? Who's in charge of you? In Matthew 6, verse 24, we read this. This is the words of Jesus. And he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus says, you can't serve both God and money. He doesn't say you can't have both God and money. I mean, I'll be honest. My prayer for all of you is that you would, you would cling to God as the first love of your life and, and walk closely with him and that you would also have all the material things you need to live a great life for Jesus. That would be my prayer. But Jesus says you, can't, you cannot be you know, subservient to, you not, cannot be ruled by, you not, can, cannot have as your master two things. You have only one master. So if God is the one who leads your life, if he is truly Lord and leads your life, money can't. 
And if money truly leads your life and it's the driving force in your life, then God can't be in that place. He says, you have to decide. That's a warning of Jesus. And I would ask you just to search your heart. and Say, what is it for me? Where's my greatest allegiance? Where do I spend the most time and energy? I can say theoretically, God's most important to me, but where's my time go? Where's my energy go? Where's my focus? Who is my master? And then also the apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, there's a lot in this passage about, about our resources. But where is your heart? Where is your heart? In 1 Timothy 6, 10, we read these words. For the love of money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The love of money. Where's my heart? Do I love stuff? You know, do, do I have a passion for stuff? Let me put it this way. When's the last time, when's the last time you had a chance to be generous and your heart just went, whoa, yes, hooray, I get it. It's an opportunity to be generous. What can I do? Woo! Remember that time just in the last week or two where you're just like, yeah! Maybe, maybe. Or when's the last time your heart was like, ooh, that, can I get it for me? Oh, I've got three of them, but I don't have an orange one yet. I need one of them, you know, and I, and I, oh, oh. When's the last time your heart went, woo, we got all excited about this new thing? Or when's the last time your heart got like, whoa, loving God, serving God, being generous in his name? What stirs your heart? What stirs your spirit? Just let God search your heart. And then Jesus gives this warning. Beware of debt. Beware of debt. The, 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 and all through the Bible, through the Gospels, through the Apostle Paul's writings in the Old Testament, there, there's a wonderful proverb from Proverbs chapter 22 that says this. It says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. The borrower is a slave to the lender. Proverbs has dozens of those kind of things that talk about be careful where you are with your finances. You can become enslaved to other people. Every time you do something where you incur debt, it's a little bit more control that somebody else has over your life. There are people that, lo that loan money you know, credit cards. Do you know that every credit card company that kindly shares a credit card with you, if you can't pay it off, they charge you, what's the word I'm looking for? They charge you interest, more money. You say, well, wait a minute, I can't afford to pay this and you're gonna charge me more? Yes, they are. And do you know when they want you to pay your credit card off? You know when they want you to? Never, never, why? Because they want you to pay them interest forever. That's how they, that's how they work. And as soon as, and the more, and I know, I've known people through the years, they go, well, I can't give to the Lord. And I can't help people in need. And I, can't, I can't even make ends meet. I'm in, I'm in debt up to here. And so th then you're in bondage. And so the Bible warns about this. It says, be careful. You can't live a generous life if you're in total financial bondage, if you're in debt to, to people and to institutions. And so, and we actually have a classes that we offer here at the church where, and, and Doug's sitting here is one of the primary leaders of, that, of one of our classes on, on you know, it called, uh, managing money God's way, right? Learning to handle your resources in a way that honors God. Some, for some of you, the first thing is going to be, I got to get out of debt. And that might mean stop buying other stuff until you're completely out of debt, until you can learn to be a different kind of person. But the, the Bible warns us is be careful of the power of debt in your life. And that may be something God speaks to you today and says, boy, I need to deal with that. I need to face that and address that. And then as, as followers of Jesus, we need to start taking little, kind of little steps forward. What's my next step? I'm gonna give you some biblical steps you can take when it comes to your stuff. To joyful. If you wanna move towards joyful generosity, how do I start down that road? Some of you are like, that's, that's totally my thing. Some of you are like, that's not my thing at all. But if you wanna start take, taking steps, here's some things you can do biblically. Number one, give to God first. Give to God first. Whenever you get resources, if you're going to give something to God, give God the first. The Bible calls it the first fruits. Proverbs 3, 9, and, and about 50 or 75 other passages. Talk about, you give, here, here's the thing about my life. If I get some money, and I give God what I have left over after I do everything I want to do, you know how much money I have to give to God? Nothing. Because there's lots of things you can do with money. But if I get something, and I say, I'm going to give God first, guess how often I have some money to give? Always. So if you want to start giving, if you're not living that way, start by doing this. When I get something, I'm going to give God first instead of the last. Because if it's the last, we don't get to it, generally speaking. We just don't get around to it. So give to God first. Here's another thing we can do if we want to take a little step. Pay attention. 
and listen for the whispers of the Holy Spirit. I challenge you this week, no matter how much or little you have, pay attention as you go through this week. Listen to people. If there's a need, and you go, boy, I could step in here and I could, and I could help out in some way. I can give five or 10 bucks here and help this person. And you hear a need, and, and the Holy Spirit whispers, do it, this is for you. Then do it. There's times that God will whisper to you, help out, make a difference. If God whispers to you and says, it's time to start giving towards, if you're part of Shoreland or if you're part of any other church, start giving towards your church. If God whispers, this is the time, respond to that and do it. But listen for God's whispers and respond. Take those little steps. And when you do, watch what happens when you begin to respond to God's promptings and God's leadings. Another baby step, think eternally. Think, don't just think about now and this life. Think eternally. It was Jesus also in Matthew chapter six who, sa- who said, you know, he basically warned us, you know, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. And then Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So say, so, okay, what am I gonna lay up treasure for? Now or for eternity? And it's so easy to invest in the now and forget about the eternity. What do you invest in that lasts forever? Those pictures I showed you at the beginning of the the sermon, including my own life, there were people who invested in a church and the gospel and reaching lost people for eternity, and those investments will echo on forever. I have looked back at my life, and I've regretted a lot of things I've spent money on through my life, but never have I regretted what I've given towards the work of Jesus. Does that last forever? And I'm going to meet people in heaven who've come to know Jesus because I was faithful in giving towards different ministries that preach the gospel and share Jesus. Think eternally. Do a heart check where Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Just quietly say, Lord, where's my heart? And you know what? That's not between me and you. That's between you and Jesus. If you're a Christian, just take a moment quietly and say, Jesus, where's my heart? What excites me? What am I focused on? Where's my energy and my attention on? And just be honest. And let God speak to your heart. That may be a next step for you, just being honest about where your heart's at. Another baby step. Enjoy good gifts. Enjoy the good things that God has given to you. You know one of the ways to work towards joyful generosity is to actually enjoy the good things that God's given to you. And he wants that. God delights in us enjoying what he gives to us. As a matter of fact, it's when we enjoy it that we feel satisfied and don't always need more. If we got a bunch of stuff and we never enjoy it, we always want more because we think that's going to make us happy. Just enjoy where you are now. Listen to these words from, from 1 Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Listen to this. Put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Do you know that's in the Bible? God richly provides everything to you for your enjoyment. Enjoy what you have. Take delight in what you have. Do I need this new one? Well, I got this one. Hey, take it out, dust it off. This is still fun. This still works. But enjoy, but but whatever you have, take enjoyment, and that will prepare you to be a more joyfully generous person. Nurture contentment. In 1 Timothy 6 6, we read these words: but godliness with contentment is great gain. There is something powerful about this posture. Here you go. Watch this. This is powerful. I'm good. I'm happy. I have what I need. I don't have everything I want, (laughs) but I have what I need. And, and, And I'm happy where I am right now. If you want to be content a week from now or a year from now, here's the key. Be content right now. But you don't understand. I don't have everything I want right now. I, I know I do understand. Nobody has everything they want. I know people, I know people that, that are very, very, very wealthy, and even they have things that they would love to have someday, right? But could you, if you can say this, Lord, I'm good right now, I'm happy right now, I'm content right now, then you will be content if you have less in the future or if you have more. You really will be. And I'll tell you another secret. If you look right now where you are, and if you say, okay, I'm not content right now, I'm not happy right now, But I will be if I can get 15% more, if I can get that raise, if I can get that upgrade. And then then I'll be happy. Time goes by and you get there. Guess what? You're saying, oh, but now I'll be happy if I have 18% more because I got it. And then you get there. Oh, but now, and you're never happy and you're never content 
Because you're always waiting for that moment, and that moment never comes. Why? Because contentment is not about how much you have. Contentment is about God having you and knowing that you're loved and knowing that you're cherished and knowing that God has lavished his grace on you. And you go, I'm good right now. I am good. And if you are, you'll find joy right now. And you'll find that at that point, you can then be generous because it's not about the next thing. It's about God's goodness. But watch your heart. Nurture contentment. And then share. It's a baby step, but learn to share. When can I share? Where can I share? And, and I love, again, and, and this is from 2 Timothy 6. It says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Be generous and just willing to share. Hey, can I share with you? Can I help you out? You're in line at a store and somebody's going through their purse and they don't, oh, I don't have enough. And they go, well, then, then take out you know, the macaroni and cheese and then take that back. And you go, oh, hey, listen, here. And you just slide a five over there and you go, you're good. Keep the change. Who does that? Who does that? People who already have everything. People who know who they are. They know where they're going. They know it's going to be okay. Share whenever you can. And show the light of Jesus. And when we take these steps, when we live this way, something happens. We, we understand that Jesus is the most joyfully generous being in the universe. We follow him, so we start to grow in our generosity. And then what we realize is that when we grow in generosity, it begins to change the world. There's world-changing generosity. You living a generous life will impact people like, like a Keith and Shannon. Like a Sherry, like a Kevin, like a Pastor Sean, like people all over this community that need to know about Jesus. Your generosity will make a difference. So how can my joyful generosity help Shoreline serve more powerfully? I want to challenge you, if you're part of Shoreline Church, if, you're, if you call this your church home, get engaged in giving in some way. Get engaged in giving in some way. How much? I don't know. Talk to the Lord about it. Pray about it. Start somewhere. But start giving. Now, let me clarify something. And I saw Tim and Della come in today. So Tim, you were on our finance team for like two decades, right? If our giving at Shoreline doubled, how much more do I get paid? What's the answer? Say it loud. Zero. Thank you, zero. My pay is not, I don't work on commissions, bonuses, or percentages. I'm not, I'm not sharing this, oh, well, that pastor wants to get more. No, I don't, my pay doesn't change. Here's how it works. I get paid, I give it to my wife, she gives me my allowance. <laughs> you know, that's, but you know, but, but it's like, I don't, I don't get pay, I don't get bonuses for, for, you know, for, for, oh, 10 new members. Ooh, here's a little, it doesn't work that way. But I, I do know the joy and the power of generosity. I know it's changed my life and it's made me more like Jesus. I want that for you. And I know that this church has changed thousands and thousands and thousands of lives and multiple thousands of people have come to faith in Jesus because of the ministry of this church. And that happens because there's people who are faithfully, joyfully generous. And I hope you would become one of those people. So start somewhere. Start somewhere. Here's a question you can ask yourself. And this is, a, this, is a, this is a deep question. Here's the question. What if everyone else gave like I do? What if, it, what if everyone who comes to Shoreline Church gave exactly like I do? What would that mean? Would it mean, well, then you'd have to close the church down because there'd be nothing. Would you say, oh, if everyone gave like I do, you could do twice as much ministry and win twice, you know, reach twice as many people because it'd be a great, you know, what if everyone gave like I do? Ask yourself that question and let God speak to your heart because we're in this ministry together. How can giving resources give a voice? Sometimes being generous actually gives a voice to touch the lives of others. And, and so, so we have a ministry where we partner. One of our partners is Compassion International. And we've been partnering with Compassion for years. They have sponsoring programs for children in different parts of the world. Here's, I'm going to show you two kids that are in, in Honduras. And, and uh, these, these two kids, or actually they're, they're, they're in El Salvador. And this, this is Juan. And on the left there is when he, uh, that, that's a couple years after Sherry and I started being part of his life. And then that's him now. He's turned to a handsome young man. And then Andrea Go to the next one there. She was just a little peanut of a little girl when we started partnering with her. And then she's turned into a nice young woman. But here's the thing. It, with Compassion International, you don't just help out every year, every month with, with food and clothing and education and medical stuff. Very reasonable amount of money. When you give to something like that, you also have the privilege of writing letters to those kids. And so we do. And can I tell you, if you give financially to support a child through Compassion and you aren't writing letters yet, please start this week. They read every letter and every letter is precious. I've met both those kids face to face. 
and they read every single, the letter gets to them. That's, that's their letter from you to them. And they write letters back to you. And that's actually from a real person coming back to you. I challenge you to, if you, if you have a child that you support, start writing letters. And here's the things that, that, that Sherry and I, you know, write letters to those kids. And there's three things we try to focus on. We encourage them to love their parents and their family because families are getting broken up in that part of the world. We encourage them to work really hard at school and get an education. And we encourage them to grow in faith and to love Jesus. We share Bible passages and pictures. We talk about our family, but we encourage them to pray and to grow in faith and to love the Bible. We get influence in their lives. Now, we don't give that money every month so we can, you know, put pressure on them. But we love those kids, and and by supporting them, it gives us an opportunity to pour into their lives and encourage them to grow in faith. If you have kids you support, get online, learn how to write an e-letter or some kind, and start encouraging them to love Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to love their parents, to be good in school, and and to find a great future. But when you're generous, it opens up the door for influence. How, How does joyful generosity reveal the love and presence of Jesus? Do you understand that when you are, when people look at you and they say, she is generous, she does it with a smile, it influences non-believers. Non-Christians are watching Christians. They really are. More closely than you think. And if you're generous, it says something about Jesus. It really does. But here's the other question. What message does a selfish Christian send? If you're a Christian who doesn't give in your church, doesn't give in your community, doesn't give to anybody, if you're a me, me, more, more kind of a Christian, And somebody's watching you as a non-believer. And they say, boy, he is all about himself. What does that say about Jesus? What does that say about the church? What does that say about you and his lordship in your life? And so our our lives of generosity or a lack of generosity, it actually sends a message to people about our Lord and our Savior. And if people look at you and see a loving, joyful, generous person, and they know you're following Jesus, they might look at Jesus and say, is that what Jesus is like? And what's the answer? Yes! (laughs) It's exactly what Jesus is like. And you're showing the world who the Savior is. Who rules my life? And who rules the universe? Who's in charge? What's in charge? The Apostle Paul said, be careful. Be careful about loving stuff. He didn't say stuff is evil, but falling in love with it has power. And could we say, God, use me. God, take the resources you put into my hands. Let me hold them loosely and let the the, the things you give flow through me to be a blessing to others. So what's my next step? Let's just quiet our hearts for a minute. I invite you just to quiet your heart, to bow your head, And I say, Lord, what's my next step when it comes to joyful generosity? And maybe for some of you today, you need to talk to God about this and say, Lord, my next step is to start giving something. To start, maybe it's it's just keeping some money in my purse or in my wallet that I'm ready if I see a need out there in the world that I can respond. Maybe that's your starting point. Maybe it's you're gonna adopt a child through compassion and start to support a child and encourage them financially but also in their spiritual life. Maybe it's saying I'm gonna start giving to Shoreline and make that part of my, my life and a regular part of my week or my month. And if you're listening to this online from another church or if you're visiting from another church, uh, don't, don't start giving to Shoreline. Give to your church wherever. If you have a home church somewhere you're just visiting and you're not giving, start there and be part of giving in that place that God has called you. But if that's you, just take a moment and say, God, May this be my day that I start with something and take that first step. For some of you, it's going to be to to step up your giving, like Keith talked about. To say, I'm giving, but Lord, you're stirring my heart to give more, to give more to the work of Shoreline, to touch lives in the future, to give more to ministries that you support, to give more for the sake of Jesus. Maybe it's taking that next step. If that's you, just take a moment and say, Lord, um, I've gotten used to giving what I'm giving, but Lord, you've, you've blessed me with even more. You're calling me to even more and I'm ready to take that step and ask God to give you the courage to take that step. For some of you, it's a heart thing. You say, I give, but man, my heart's not in it. My joy's not there. And your prayer today might just be, God, help me find joy in my generosity. Let my heart be filled with excitement. Let me see the, the impact that my generosity is, is having and teach me to have joy in my generosity. For some of you, you need to pray, Lord, let me hear the voice of your spirit as I walk through my days. Let me notice needs and say, Lord, is this one for me? And if the spirit nudges and says, this is for you, be generous. Wherever you are, whatever the need is, 
respond as the Holy Spirit leads. And Lord, for all of us, we pray that we will be bold and confident and content and thankful for what we have. May we live with open hearts and open hands to share what you've put into our care. Lord, make us more and more generous and more and more joyful as we grow in generosity. And may the world see the face and the grace and the goodness of the one who is the most generous being in all the universe, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. We pray this in his name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of quick invitations. If you're online and you've been online for a long time, uh, next week is what we're calling post-Super Bowl, uh, post-mandates uh, Sunday. We're going to make sure there's a seat for you. Please feel free to come and join us if you're local and you're able. Come join us. We'd love to see you. Uh, for all that are here, I invite you to come back again next Sunday as we continue in Organic Disciples. If you need prayer for anything at all, we have on campus, come indoors here for prayer, up at the front of the stage, online. Call the number you see and use the email address you see and send in those prayer needs, and we'd love to pray for you. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're new online, just text the word WELCOME to the number you see right there on your screen, and we want to give you a warm personal welcome. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus here, and you're new, go by the Connection Center. They want to give you a gift bag and answer any questions you have. Uh, and so go by the Connection Center. And... Uh, Sherry and I, have, for the last two years, we've not done a time where we actually greet people face to face, uh, but we're doing that today. So when I close and send you off with a blessing, I'm going to sneak out that way, cut around, and we're going to join you under the pergola over there. And we'll be there to meet you. If you're new, please come by and say hi to us. We'd love to meet you, have a prayer with you. If we know you really well, we love you, leave us alone. Because we want to greet some new people, okay? We love you with all our hearts, but we want to meet new people today. So if you're new, come by and say hello. Also, on your way out, if you have to use the restrooms, I've been told that we're having some problems today, so if you can manage it, head on home and use your facilities. If you can't, we'll find a spot for you on the campus that's working. There, that's, that's a nice way to finish. Can I get an amen? Praise the Lord. All right. If you're able to stand wherever you are, let's stand together and just receive this blessing as we part ways. May you walk through every day of your life with your eyes fixed on Jesus, the most generous being in the universe. Be amazed and in awe of his goodness and his generosity to you. And then may you become a joyfully generous Christian who sees God's goodness and lives with open hands and open hearts. And then may the world see Jesus in you and be drawn to the one who is generous, who's made a way for them because they see his generosity alive in you. God bless you. Have a great week. Keep your eyes open to see needs and meet them in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.